Welcome to the Worst Sports Channel on YouTube, Hot Garbage Sports with me, Coach Ryan D. Ooh, tough night for the Habs, great night for the Lightning. Game one is in the books, extremely, extremely reminiscent of game one between Vegas and the Montreal Canadiens. So there's no need to panic, but Coach Ryan D is going to take you through every single goal, what happened in tonight's game, and what the main storylines are for from a tactical perspective. So we are going to talk about Carey Price. Was he normal or was he playoff price? We're going to talk about Kucherov. Were we able to shut him down or was Kucherov just that good? We're going to talk about the Habs penalty kill, which has been unbeatable. Not tonight. Then we're going to talk about the Habs stretch pass as well as their 1-3-1 and their 1-2-2-4 checks. And did any of this work? <gasps> You're going to have to stick with us until the end to find out. So did the Habs lose the game or is this just the lightning being the lightning? Make sure you go ahead, check out my video above in the card and down below in the comments where I talk about the Montreal Canadian system and what has brought them to the dance. So you can have a little bit of background as to what we're talking about in today's game. So let's go ahead and roll the intro. Here's And if you're new to Hot Garbage Sports, we have been growing like gangbusters. Thank you so much to the amazing Habs fans and Lightning fans that are on this channel. Love each and every one of you. As you can see behind me, we're just a biased Jets fan. Are we cheering for anybody in this series? We're just cheering for good hockey here. So we'll try to give you as pragmatic of a breakdown as we can. If you enjoy the content, please smash the subscribe. Help us keep growing. Please hit a like. It helps us out with the YouTube algorithm. Trains leaving the station. We'd love you to be on it. Choo-choo, baby. All right, on to the game. Now, we talked about in the video above and below that we alluded to the HAB system of what brought them to the dance. We didn't get a chance to break down the lightning system, but that's okay. We're going to do it today. So what ends up bringing the Habs to the dance? It's three key factors. One, they cheat and leave the zone early, stretching the zone, causing breakaways. Well, there was two breakaways today, one from Shea Weber, one from Brendan Gallagher, but Andre Vasilevsky shuts those down. Vasilevsky is so good so good that he is going to be hard to score on in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. So it's been working for the Habs. They've beaten elite goaltenders in Connor Hellebuck, Marc-Andre Fleury, and heck, even Robin Leonard. But Vasilevsky is another animal, and he shuts the door on them. The only goal that went in today on him required four or five bounces. So I'd be very, very nervous if I was a Montreal Canadian right now about Andre Vasilevsky. That's the biggest takeaway if I'm the Habs. How do I solve Vasilevsky? Let's keep going through. The Habs penalty kill gets exploited by Nikita Kucherov today. Why? Goal five and goal one are interesting. Carey Price himself, and you'll see it as we break down the clips, in my opinion, was normal today. He wasn't bad. Carey Price did not lose this game. That's what people are going to hear when they say, when they hear me say he wasn't playoff Price. They're going to hear me say he lost you the game. That is not what I'm saying. Price made unbelievable saves played just as much of the elite goaltender as he could today, but a few of the pucks that ended up beating him, normally God mode price ends up stopping those. It's not expected. It's not required. The Habs team themselves needs to score and play better team defense, but it's interesting to note because he's been stopping those for three series now. So has the time run up? Is the bonus clock done? Do you need to find a different way to beat him? That's the second storyline to watch. So Vasilevsky being that good, how do you beat him? Will Carey Price return to God mode playoff price that is unfreaking beatable even when he should be beatable in game two? Kucherov scoring is a very dangerous thing to think about because they fill up the no line and the checking in team defense of the Montreal Canadiens is key to slowing them down. And the Montreal Canadiens have slowed down the best player and best players on every team up till this moment. But Kucherov is still hot. That could be a very scary problem. And another thing we're going to note today, is it going to screw with the Montreal Canadiens that their penalty kill just got scored on? I'm not sure. This has been one of the best penalty kills out there, and eventually one has to go in. It's just really tough when it's the fifth goal from a terrible angle from the number one player that you were trying to shut down on the lightning. That's a lot of things to get inside the head of a player. So in summary, did the Habs lose or did the lightning win? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, this is just the lightning. There are that darn good. The lightning were able to attack with four, something that the Vegas Golden Knights were unable to do past game two. That is a key to note that the Vegas Golden Knights did this to the Habs in game one. The Habs went back and adjusted. Will they adjust in game two? Let me know down below in the comments. Stay tuned to the end of the video for me to answer that question. The Habs also played good. And pretty darn good in my opinion, but not perfect like they have been playing in most games leading up to this one. 
So that is difficult. When the Habs play perfect, and we talked about it in their system, they're playing one of the best four checks, one of the best trap style games I've ever seen, a unique stretch offense. The team is bought in and playing together and making very few mistakes as a unit. They did make some mistakes tonight. So with that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at the clips. Let's take a look at the magic that is the Tampa Bay Lightning. Let's talk about the Habs. Stick with us. Here we go. All right, so goal one, how does it happen? Well, you have a three on two here where Montreal is leading the way and they cause a real nasty turnover at the line, which becomes unfortunately a pattern for the Habs in this game. So as Nick Suzuki is carrying the puck here, he's going to do a few interesting things. He's going to skate into these defensemen and he's going to bump it out wide, which is exactly what you should do on a three on two. And then he is not going to drive the mid lane. We talk about driving mid lane all the time. Let's go a few frames forward so you can see what happens. And also note here, Braden Point his distance on the ice. He is going to make one of the best back checks I have seen in hockey here. Five hard strides down the middle with his head down. Then he picks his head up. His stick is out. He is able to intercept this pass because of what Nick Suzuki does. All right, so we've gone a few frames forward. Suzuki has the puck here, and he should be looking to bounce it out. He doesn't. He's going to take a couple strides here into the middle, and he's going to drop pass it. And even worse, after he drop passes it, he's going to glide around over here to the wide zone. This is a young man's mistake. This is not what you can do. You bump it outside, and you drive the mid lane. And the reason for that is, if Suzuki is able to bump this puck outside and then hit the mid lane hard, it's going to push these two defenders way back, giving his two players a a ton of room to work with and it will negate the Braden point back check and for all of you counting let's just do go ahead and do the Braden point stride checker here he is like I said head is down he's coming with a couple hard strides right up the middle of the ice okay so there we go there's that drop pass it's been dropped Nick Suzuki has taken his little J hook here nobody has driven the mid lane so the defensemen get to stand here with impunity then and because he didn't drive that mid lane Wow, look at point cover ground. He has caught up eight or nine strides and those eight or nine strides got caught up because of the Suzuki dipsy doodle and going wide and not bouncing it out. This is the problem with the drop pass on this one. You're about to see a stick go through the middle and create that nasty turnover that leads to goal. Okay, so through that turnover, you'll see the puck down here. It's circled. Now we have one, two Montreal Canadiens that are caught, and this is what we call the transition game. The transition game is when it goes from one team stick, the Montreal Canadiens, over to another team stick, the Tampa Bay Lightning, really quickly, and the direction of the game changes. So we were just going towards Vasilevsky, and within half a second, we're you're going up ice it only takes 0.7 seconds for the lightning to end up in the montreal canadian zone and the montreal canadians cannot stack their four men at the line in their one three one defensive system in order to prevent this goal because they got caught in the transition game so hopefully that explanation helps a lot of you to understand when announcers are saying things like they play fast, the lightning play fast. They're able to go ahead and make a turnover and end up in the other team zone quickly with speed by moving the puck north to south. And that is what is also meant by transition game. When one team has the puck on their stick, it is turned over and it is already in your defensive zone. That is the speed of the transition and that's the speed of the Tampa Bay Lightning and it exploits the Montreal Canadiens here on one bad decision. Drive the mid lane. And trust me, Nick Suzuki has been told to drive the mid lane his entire life. You've heard it on this channel a million times. Drive the mid lane, drive the mid lane. Never change it. It's not broken. There's no cute way to fix it. Don't bump to the outside. So conversely, the other way, Palat has the puck over here and he's going to end up bumping into the zone wide, which is fine. Because what we're looking for here is Blake Coleman to now drive the mid lane, which lo and behold, he does, pushing the defenseman back and he gets a goal off of it. Nikita Kucherov over here can either decide to go to the top of the circle or he can decide to follow behind Coleman for support. Okay, so there you go. Palat with the puck. That mid lane has been drived. Look at the separation of the Montreal Canadiens defense because Coleman kept skating. That puck ends up getting bumped out. And again, what are the Habs doing here? Like, you need to have your man. This is way too far away. And you're going to decide to do a reach-in stick check. You need to close the gap. That yellow line here is gap. And you need to lift his stick and be beside your man. Play physical. You can't just reach in there. So there it is. The little stick reach-in, as you can see. Puck is right here. And it is going top shelf on carry price and as we can see nikita kucherov decided to take that high point i would have taken over here but who am i to tell him he's one of the best players left in the playoffs right now really nice goal by the lightning 
So that's a lot. There were a lot of things that ended up leading to that goal that are not normally done by Montreal. So their young gun, this is where coaches get nervous, makes a really bad decision and a bad turnover by not driving the mid lane and doing what works. He's trying to get creative. Braden Point makes the best back check I have seen. No one has back checked better than the Montreal Canadiens other than the Tampa Bay Lightning. And when your superstar in Braden Point is making that back check, this is why people talk about defensive two-way centermen. He's not floating looking for goals. He is moving his butt backwards to turn over pucks, and he does. And then we talk about speed, playing fast in transition, which happens from the Tampa Bay Lightning. And then we go right back to a mid-lane drive. <sighs> there are so many things that happen in hockey unbelievable goal loved it okay so somebody asked me to break down the montreal canadians penalty kill let's go ahead and do this i know it's at the end of the kill but here is what makes their kill so unique normally teams run in a one three one setup so let's go ahead and take a look at tampa bay here one here's your threes and here's your one so you normally have one guy down low one guy in the middle two shooters to the outside and one up top that's called a one three one Montreal, theoretically, with the puck, which is, you know, about over here, should be running something that looks like this. You should have a defenseman here. You should have another defenseman here because the puck's over there. So you should have your 2D here. You should have another forward over here and you should have another forward over here in what is called the T intersection. It's kind of like a little made up space at the top of the circle. So you can go ahead and block and take away shooters and you can go ahead and leave two guys down here to make cross ice passes. But Montreal doesn't do that. Ducharme's got them playing a very unique system where they're basically running a straight line across the bottom with three players, as you can see here, and one player across the top. So they're crowding the bottom in order to create an even amount of players, three players on three and sometimes four on four, and they're giving up the top. You give up the top and now you're forcing these shooters and the top to make these pretty much longer shots that you're banking on carry price to be able to save. So basically what you're trying to do in this kill formation is not allow any second or third chances. And it's really worked for them because price is that good. And that, that still went well today for Montreal. I mean, they did excellent and Tampa Bay, nothing wrong with their power play. That's exactly how you should set up a power play. So now, you know, thank you for that lovely question. What makes the Habs penalty kill unique? Okay, so you remember I talked about in the last video, the stretch pass. Their team leaves the zone before they should leave the zone, and it's weird, but it's been working, so it's weird in a good way. They get caught with this, and Price ends up bailing them out. There's a very simple way to beat this system, and maybe John Cooper did get to see my video, because it looks like he may have this pegged, but again, it's only game one. Let's go to the tape, take a look. Okay, so what do I mean? Montreal leaves the zone before they win battles on the puck, so there's a few things that are happening down here. One, this player is what is called a puck support. You always need to be having puck support, meaning you need to be a stick length or two away from the person who is battling the puck. So when a loose puck comes out, you can support him. This down here is the puck battle. Now, there's a few things wrong with this puck battle down here. Number one is this Montreal Canadian right here is on the wrong side of the puck. The right side of the puck is to be between the lightning and your goalie. So he actually needs to be over here. Because he's caught on the wrong side, that forces this player here who is puck support to be over here and on the right side of the puck, meaning between the puck and your net. So anything in this line right here would be considered the right side of the puck. One player is on the right side, but he's not battling. The guy who's battling is on the wrong side of the puck. This is worth noting, mostly because it's wrong, but the Montreal Canadian player is going to leave the zone assuming that his player is going to win it because he's going to have a breakaway if they work out. But this usually ends up turned over and in the back of your net. However, when you have Carey Price, you can make mistakes like this. And this isn't a mistake. This is purposeful part of their system. It's what the Habs do. So there you go. Someone needs to tell Montreal and Ducharme you're playing against a you're playing against a Norris Trophy nominee and Norris Trophy defenseman Victor Hedman. Of course he wins that battle. It's Victor freaking Hedman wins the battle. And look, Captain Steven Stamkos is in the middle out of nowhere. And here you go. He's already left the zone. Checked out. Bye bye. And now you have another player. Oh, on the wrong side of the puck. You only have two Montreal Canadiens on the right side of the puck at this point, and they were down low battling. This is how you beat the stretch pass and turn it over and create offense. And this is why most teams don't run it that way. It's not a bad thing because it's worked, but like there's a reason systems are enacted the way they're enacted in hockey. And when a guy like me who's been doing this for so long is surprised and flabbergasted when something's working because there are counters to everything in hockey. And the Tampa Bay Lightning are not only good enough to counter, but they're so much more talented than any other team in the NHL that they'll probably just bury it on you. But again, price saves the day on this one.
So goal number two is a real doozy too. Blake Coleman ends up scoring this off another Montreal turnover. And when Montreal causes this turnover at the line, it doesn't allow them to get back into their 1-3-1 defensive structure. It allows the Lightning to attack with four, which they do. We have the same old story, a transition game that goes horribly, horribly wrong for Montreal because Tampa Bay is that fast on the transition and they end up scoring. Is there a little bit of puck lock off a leg? For sure. But you cannot turn over pucks like this like Montreal does. Okay, so puck is over here and we're going to end up seeing a turnover. And what don't we see here right now, ladies and gentlemen? And if you said, I don't see a mid lane drive for 200, I would say you are correct. There is no mid lane drive. We have one hab and we have two habs and we have all this open space with no one going through the middle. This is a problem. This problem forces Montreal to set up here with a little dipsy doodle and try to force a puck into three Tampa Bay Lightning defenders. And these defenders are allowed to step up and gap up at the line because no one has pushed them back because they're not driving the mid lane. <sighs> mid lane drive. I know it's a repetitive game. We end up causing a turnover over here. If you're Montreal, puck goes the other way. So as you can see, he's forced the puck through. It ends up bouncing over here. We have somewhat semblance of trying to drive the mid lane but what montreal should have done here is they should have recognized again young players young players make mistakes should have recognized it and dumped it in instead of trying to make a pass that's two times if montreal would have either driven the lane or dumped it in a goal wouldn't have gone their way a little bit sloppy okay so now we're going to see a transition game puck is in the middle of your screen the puck has now changed direction from north to south for tampa bay Again, puck is still in the middle of the ice here. Coleman, just beautiful pass off the outside of his skates. Again, this is practice, all skill. Coleman right here ends up making a beautiful backhand pass through the legs. Unbelievable job here. And now we can see as well that you don't have one, two, three, and four Montreal Canadiens in their either one, three, one, or a one, four defensive structure. You have one, two, three Habs that are caught behind and flat footed. This becomes an odd man rush. So Coleman has gone over to Goudreau here and take a look at what Yanni Gord's going to do. He's only going to drive the mid lane. That mid lane drive ends up battling the Montreal Canadiens defenders. Don't bite. You get a really nice battle here. So that puck ends up banking off the skate and an unfortunate bounce back to Coleman who snipes it with Gord in front as a screen. So, I mean, really, how many things can go wrong in that play? Turnover at the blue line. No mid lane drive from the Habs caught without your 1-4 or 1-3-1 one, one defensive system. A puck off the leg. Tampa Bay is driving the mid lane. Yanni Gord has screened Carey Price. Everything, everything on that play was wrong for the Habs and correct from the Lightning. The Lightning are damn good. Okay, now here's a great example of Shea Weber activating and leaving the D zone with speed as part of their stretch pass offense. So you end up with a 2-1-1 -one -one that turns into a breakaway here. But this is where I get really nervous because Vasilevsky just made this look easy and you need to score on these. Okay, so here's another really good example of the 1-4 or 1-3-1. It's the same thing. Like, honestly, a 1-3-1 and a 1-4 is the same thing. So if you wonder why I keep saying it that way, some people prefer it one way, some people prefer it the other way. It just means there's four on the blue line. Here's a good example of Tampa Bay beating that 1-4-1 with, well, basically throwing a puck up the middle as hard as you can. So your puck is down here. You're going to fire that puck as hard as he can to his two players that are at the line, and he ends up making a one-tap right over he could have also dumped it in both are effective in breaking up the one four you know that puck has come through it's a little one tap he barely touched it one tap through yes montreal could have had this but again he's in an awkward position you can see he's skating one direction his stick is paced the other way like this is a pretty tough puck to get no matter what tampa bay ends up getting it busting in with speed that's how you break up a one four and quickly for anyone that's new to the channel one four four players in somewhat of a line or a cluster one is over here it's just designate there's one ahead of the play the montreal goal by ben Sherratt here to make it 2-1 the one thing that makes me nervous here is the josh anderson shot so that puck has come north to south and it's crossed what we call the royal road that invisible line down the center that makes pucks very difficult to stop the goaltenders as you can see here as that puck crosses over Vasilevsky has already made it to his post. There is some daylight up here for sure, but Anderson really doesn't have much to shoot at, and this makes me very nervous. If Vasilevsky is on this series, this could be quick. But luckily, that puck ends up being turned over again by the Montreal Canadiens, wrapping it around to the half wall, ends up finding it, moving it over to his buddy Ben Schrott here, who has got a cannon of a shot, and yes, it did cross the Royal Road, so making it difficult again. 
But the problem with this goal is, is it took two, maybe three deflections to go in. That's great. That's great that it went in. But if this is the only way the Vasilevsky can be beat, that's really, really troubling because that means he's on. He had no chance in this. So great job by Montreal on this goal. A little bit of puck luck from it too. But again, no such thing as luck when you're putting pucks on net. Purposeful play. All right, so the third goal from Tampa Bay has a lot going on. There is a turnover by Sergachev. We know that. But let's go take a look at this because there is a world where Cole Caulfield's world is ended on this play by Sergachev if Sergachev so wants to. Sure, he ends up playing the puck first, but there is absolutely no requirement to do so. This is a suicide situation if I've ever seen one. Young Cole Caulfield does not have his head up. He's looking backwards for the puck. And in the playoffs, this is 50-50 of whether or not the defenseman is going to bury you and he would be justified in burying you in this play. So lucky, lucky, lucky for Cole Caulfield that he's still okay. Ends up going for the puck, which causes a goal, which is great. That's how we want hockey played. But just because we want hockey played like that doesn't mean players are always going to play that way. And this was definitely an opportunity for a Scott Stevens moment. Let's check it. So here you go. You can see it here. Pucks here. Take a look at Caulfield's head. He's not looking for it. He was just looking back this way and he's tracking the puck around as it's coming up. And here is Sergachev. As soon as that puck gets near Caulfield, Sergachev has a choice. Play the puck and intercept the play, which he made, or absolutely blow up and destroy Cole Caulfield at this point. And you can do it without targeting the head. You can do it clean to the body, but this would be an absolute train wreck if he chose that way. So very lucky for Cole that he ends up choosing the puck on this option and looks to score. Okay, so here you go. You got two players that are reaching in in interesting body position. Sticks kind of right here, puck somewhere right here on the stick. He ends up knocking it down. And because he knocks it down again, it's another turnover. We play with speed again. The puck ends up going the other direction. And you're going to see a regroup from three Tampa Bay players up the ice. And they're able to get a little bit of a lucky goal here. So Sergachev knocks that puck over. You only have two Habs back and you got another two Habs that are caught because of that turnover. So that puck moves over here and you can see the puck is right here. Defenseman is trying to catch it, play it out. There's two schools of thought here. You leave this alone and you don't play it or you try to play it. Sometimes it's darned if you do, darned if you don't, but he ends up and Palat is standing right here and his hand-eye coordination is way too good because as this puck is bouncing around, he's able to basically knock it out of midair here and beat Carey Price. So yes, is it a little bit lucky that it ends up with a fortunate bounce off a of Hab? Sure, but the Sergachev turnover, nothing nothing lucky about that. That's all skill. Andre Palat knocking out of midair, nothing lucky about that, all skill. All right, and then we're back to the good old Montreal Canadian face-off. In the last couple of videos, I said, again, links are below and above with your old Montreal Canadiens breakdown from Vegas. We took a look at Montreal's Vegas face-off setup and showed why it was wrong. They had two wingers up high and a defenseman down low on the off wing. I said, you should stack them in a line. Montreal ends up doing this. So again, these aren't like, they're not watching my videos, guys. These are just normal hockey adjustments that a coach would make. So good that Montreal makes it, but then they get beat by the same darn thing. Like, hi, let's go take a look at the clip. Okay, so in yellow, I'm going to write what Montreal used to do. They used to do is you'd have a defenseman here as a post turtle, which means he's useless. You'd have a winger here on the hash marks and you'd have a winger here in this kind of formation. And then what happens is this winger would get tied up. This defenseman's useless and a puck would go in from Kucherov or whoever's standing in the back here when it was Vegas. So they end up changing it. And the adjustment they make is exactly what you should make. D, winger, winger in a line. So they make that adjustment. What needs to happen here, though, is Jeff Petrie needs to stand in here and create this battle, not the winger. Petrie's got to get this man. Our winger here has to be able to fight his way through this check and decide whether it's going to be Kucherov or the point that he ends up going to. That's what we have to cover, but he doesn't. He gets tied up here and bumped and basically beaten, and, and that happens. Sometimes you just get beaten. This man needs to go out to the point which he gets there. It just doesn't work out. So unique face off here because the face off doesn't go directly back to Kucherov. It's a soft face off win over here. These, this is really nice hands by point, by the way, off this draw. Soft face off win to the left here to allow Kucherov to skate into it. And then you can see the battle here ensues between winger and winger. We needed Petrie to get into it. You can see it. Take a look at where Petrie's eyes are looking. He knows that's his man, but he wasn't able to isolate him quick enough. And now you're going to just see Kucherov walk across the middle because he's going to get pushed over there. I get it. It's a lot of pink and he's going to score. Okay, coach. So then they lined up the exact way you said they should line up and it still didn't work. What do you want them to do? I want them to spread themselves out a little bit more by a couple feet. Let's see if they do that next game. Go to the board. I'll show you. 
Look how tight these three are. I would go D, winger, winger. A little bit more out and I would take this path around the back side to make sure that that shot happens. Sure, if the puck comes back here, you can end up scoring. But if that happens, that happens. That's how I would go ahead and make just a very minor adjustment on this faceoff. Okay, so there you have it. The first four goals. There's a fifth goal, which is a bad angle goal on a penalty kill by Kucherov. We're not going to spend any more time breaking that down. We have now talked about what happened here. What Montreal wanted to do this game. They were unable to execute it. Tampa Bay beat them with skill, with speed, with turnovers, with deep talent, and with really, really good systems play, as well as excellent goaltending. But it is only game one. So if I start hearing things about sweep, I will just point you back to the Vegas series. If I start hearing things about other, I'll just point you back to the Leafs series. Until the Habs actually get swept, I do not believe they will end up getting swept. So Habs fans... I think you can absolutely steal game two because you have shown me now in three series that your coaching staff and team knows how to adjust, and I think they will adjust. I also think Carey Price will level up back to God mode again from great mode to God mode. He played great today, absolutely did, but there's another gear for him yet. He doesn't need to hit it, not his fault, not blaming him, but if he gets there, they're going to be impossible to beat. But the tricky part of this equation for the Habs are going to be, can you actually beat Vasilevsky? Vasilevsky played amazing. And if he keeps playing amazing like this, yeah, it, it absolutely could be a sweep. But I'm not calling sweep. Not a chance. I think the Habs are getting back in this series. So I, this has been Coach Ryan D with Hawk Garbage Sports. Thanks for sticking with us. We'll catch you Wednesday for game two.